I'm at the heart of a dying star, or potentially on a desert planet with two suns and a whole lot of destiny. Physically, of course, I'm in a manufacturing warehouse on the campus of the University of Utah. But if you put this all together in just the right way and put some really spot technology in the mix, then you get something like this. This is Dome X, the most advanced planetarium that we've ever created. With it, you can almost touch the rings of Saturn as they slowly accumulate around the moon Pam, turning it more and more into a pancake. Today, we'll be finding out the history of planetariums and learning just how does a planetarium work. Humankind has always been fascinated with the night sky, painting what we saw in our caves and tombs. However, it wasn't until 1299, with the Fifth Crusade, that we see what would be recognisable as a planetarium. Among other curiosities brought back from the East, Emperor Frederick II acquired and then subsequently lost a rather curious tent. Along the domed canvas was hundreds of tiny holes, reflecting the constellations above. On a bright sunny day, people would be able to sit inside, and a clockwork mechanism would make the canvas move around them, as if the stars above were truly moving. The next great leap in planetarium technology came in 1923 with the Zeiss projector, descendants of which are still being installed in science museums all around the world. Boston's own Charles Hayden Planetarium uses this one, the Zeiss Starmaster Skyball. At its core is an exceptionally bright light bulb, which shines through a number of lenses scattered across the outside of the dome. Obviously, the folks who run this planetarium weren't going to let me pop one of these lenses out to show you. But with the help of German YouTuber and engineer Rumpkesh Kevink, I found something even better. This is the world's very first planetarium projector. At nearly 100 years old, it is a marvel of 20th century mechanical engineering. Nowadays, I don't think people would even attempt to build it. In fact, back then, no one wanted to. And it was only after a fair amount of arm twisting by its inventor, Walters Bowersfeld, and the director of the Deutsches Museum, Oscar von Miller, which the Zeiss company was eventually convinced to manufacture it. The back of each lens contains a thin copper film. Light passes through these carefully positioned holes to be projected onto the dome as stars. This large cylindrical section contains rings of interlocking gears, carefully made to track the positions of the sun, our moon, or a planet, and then project these onto the dome. After years of restoration, today the Mark I projector is back wowing audiences at its new home in Bohaus and Wilson. In 1962, Mariner became the first spacecraft to visit another planet. In 1977, we sent the Voyager probes to the edge of the solar system. Now, the universe wasn't just some static wallpaper of the night sky, but rather a real 3D place which we could traverse. This deeper appreciation of the universe demanded a whole new type of planetarium. Rather than having the audience passively sit as the stars move around them, instead they were able to take off like in a starship and fly through the galaxy. Of course, such a maneuver would be impossible using traditional optomechanical systems. They would need to rely on computer graphics, which is, of course, where our story returns to the University of Utah. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the University of Utah was the place for computer graphics. Students from here went on to build Adobe, Pixar, and the infamous Utah teapot. In addition to their research work, professors Evans and Sutherland created a computer graphics company of the same name. One of their major products was flight simulators, and they were so good at it that in 1977, NASA commissioned a rather special tool. You see, at the time, NASA had a rather optimistic view of exactly how much budget Congress was going to give them, and were in the stages of planning a mission from Earth to Saturn. They wanted to be able to train the astronauts in celestial navigation, where they could see how nearer stars shifted more than those that were further away, and therefore work out exactly where they were in the solar system. Unfortunately, even though this is a pretty epic journey, it's not quite long enough to see any noticeable shift in stars, so it was ultimately abandoned. Evans and Sutherland still wanted to pursue the project, however, but they would need a new sponsor. One that didn't just want to explore the solar system, but the entire galaxy. 
While this star-stimulated discussion was going on, a subdivision of ENS was busy at work, creating the graphical readout displays for the movie Star Trek Wrath of Khan. They might not look like much compared to modern effects, but at the time, these were truly groundbreaking. Despite being told not to include any corporate logos or brand names, if you reverse the USS Reliance identifier, then it reads Evans, after the company Evans & Sutherland. Meanwhile, if you flip the Enterprise's own identifier, we get Neil, which is the name of one of the animators working on the shot. No science fiction epic would be complete without a few sweeping shots of space. Often this was done by physically painting in the background. Hearing of the simulator side project, visual effects supervisor for the film Jim Villeneuve challenged ENS to make a fly-through of a real starfield. They pulled it off, and it turns out they did it so well that it became the opening credits for the entire film. These aren't just random dots we're flying through. These are scientifically accurate, correctly positioned stars within our own Milky Way. Audiences love these effects, so the next obvious step from the big screen was to take it to the planetarium dome. This is the Digistar 2, our first true digital planetarium. If we open it up, you can see that it's made of three distinct parts. At the bottom, we have the computer processor. Slightly above is the cathode ray tube, and at the very top, we have a massive fisheye lens. What's exciting about this planetarium is that because everything is run by a computer, the presentation can be adapted on the go. An operator would fly their virtual viewport through time and space, and the computer would go to its database for what objects might be visible. This viewport would then be drawn onto the dome using the cathode ray tube and vector graphics. The control panel contains a keyboard, six degrees of freedom joystick, and in order to zoom through the universe, a large button, helpfully labeled, boldly go. If you've been to a planetarium any time in the last two decades, then chances are it didn't use vector graphics or fancy star balls, but instead looked a bit more like this, using digital projectors. Let me show you something really cool. Can we turn on projector one? Two, three, four, five. As you can see, the dome is actually being covered by five separate projectors, which each have a corresponding field of view. When setting up a planetarium for the first time, the operator needs to carefully align each of these projections so that they blend together seamlessly. The image is made by passing different colored light through a grid-like array of cells, which open or close to let this light through. The colors are then recombined and transmitted outward. This is known as raster graphics. While it allows for a nearly infinite number of scenes, there is a limit as to how many cells, and thus pixels, we can have on an individual projector meaning we need a team in order to cover the dome in any sort of resolution. Despite these drawbacks and the extra effort we had to go, I think the results are well worth it, allowing us to display photographs taken in outer space and to show complex 3D renderings of real astronomical bodies. So that's the projector, what about the dome? If you get up close, you can see that the screen is a light grey colour and perforated with millions of tiny holes. Light projected onto the screen bounces off to be reflected into the audience. That is how we see. Since the dome is curved, some of the light that bounces from the screen will then instead go to another part of the screen before finally being reflected into your eye. That leads to weird bright splotches where there should be none, and making the black void of space more like grey. This effect is known as cross-scatter. No one had really noticed it with old-school star-based planetariums since there wasn't all that much light to reflect but once we could display extra large photographs, then the whole thing becomes rather distracting. The mix of colour and texture used for the dome surface is designed to balance reflectivity for optimal viewing. All those perforated holes that we noticed earlier play two very important roles. Firstly, they allow sound to pass through, being produced by these massive speakers which surround the audience. The holes are carefully sized so that they're large enough to allow the sound to pass through unimpeded, but not too large so as to interfere with the visual experience of being inside the dome. The holes also have another benefit, allowing cool air to pass through, making sure that the audience doesn't get too hot. 
So those were the planetariums of the past and present. But what about the future? Nowadays, we don't just expect to see photographs of planets, some of us might get to visit them for real. How can a planetarium prepare you for that? This is the Domex, or a prototype of one anyway. If you're going to be using this with an actual planetarium, then you'd probably want to put the screen all the way up there. Fortunately though, being down here on ground level allows us to take a closer look at how it works. If we pop out one of the panels, you can see that it's actually an array of tiny LED lights. These are about 40 times brighter than you can get with a regular projector. On top of that, behind the LEDs, the panels are painted matte black, which significantly cuts back on cross-reflection. Together, this results in a much higher contrast, more visually stunning experience. In fact, shows like The Mandalorian are using similar LED domes to film scenes on other planets, without needing to resort to green screen. In a way, it's like we've come full circle. From pinpricks of light on a canvas tent, to a starball, two types of projector, and now back to dots of light on the wall, planetariums have grown as both a reflection of our technology, as well as our understanding of the cosmos. Every human throughout history has looked up to the stars, or at least we did, until cities and their light pollution grew so as to obscure even the brightest of these celestial bodies. As the next generation of planetarium come online, will these be enough to substitute for the skies that we once lost? Or perhaps will they remind us to save a few places of true night? Only time will tell. This has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. While well, we still can keep looking up.